in this video i am going to discuss regarding cardiovascular assessment okay so uh, whenever we discuss cardiac assessment it is always not only the heart it also includes the blood vessels cardiovascular assessment so there are certain main headings which should be there in cardiovascular assessment uh, so i'll just give you an overall picture what all usually we do an assessment in cardiovascular the first one is a cardiovascular assessment you should write the patient profile number two was the initial assessment like which includes the chief complaints the vital signs the height and the weight past health history is something very significant in cardiovascular assessment current lifestyles and psychosocial status which includes nutrition smoking alcohol exercise and drugs family history very very important in cardiovascular assessment next is after collecting all these history we are going to see about the review of the signs and symptoms related to cardiovascular system which includes usually the chest pain the cough the dyspnea edema nocturia etc then the most important the crux of the cardiac assessment physical examination okay which includes three assessment neck vessels the precordium and the peripheral vascular assessment only when you do these three things you are completing a cardiovascular assessment it is not only the precordium assessment we have to examine the neck because the most important blood vessels we are going to get the data related to cardiac assessment from the neck the next thing is the precordium and very important i mean though it comes at the last it plays an important role in the vascular that is the peripheral vascular assessment so uh, let me tell you uh, what i am doing in this video is not a very detailed examination or a detailed study of cardiovascular assessment it is just to help students who are at their basic level who are trying to understand what is cardiovascular assessment it is only a supplementary part definitely your uh, wonderful teachers will be teaching you in detail specifically what else is needed in cardiovascular assessment so please don't think this is an advanced way of teaching never and uh, also it is not that it is the it, whatever i teach this is only the comprehensive uh, don't take like that okay what i am uh, telling through these videos is at least the basic things which uh, as students you should know when you are trying to study about cardiovascular assessment so the first one as per to our picture here is patient profile so what we have to collect in patient profile the most important and the basic things which all students know what you have to collect is the name of the patient the age the gender education occupation the hospital in patient number ip number the name of the ward the bed number the date of admission the diagnosis all these things comes under the patient profile next is the uh, number 2 what we have to do in cardiac assessment is you have to write the initial assessment findings what is this initial assessment findings it includes the chief complaints okay initial assessments means it is a chief complaint we all know usually a patient who is having a cardiac problem will have a number of complaints depending on the condition now for example the first picture okay it shows about a child who is a uh, tired okay usually we find tiredness is a clinical manifestation of cardiac disease especially in valvular heart diseases okay whenever there is some valvular incompetence regurgitation stenosis usually adequate blood supply is not there all throughout the body ending up with the person feeling completely tired so that is why usually we write activity intolerance as a nursing diagnosis for such patients number 2 was chest pain chest pain uh, i think all nursing students know that when myocardial when patients with comes with an mi okay the first thing what they tell us is they are having a chest pain it is not only in myocardial infarction in case even like a pericarditis pericardial infusion there is heaviness of the chest there is pain so chest pain is one feature we see in angina mi etc next is weight related to weight do you think this uh, has an important role in cardiovascular assessment answer is definitely yes because weight loss weight gain both can be seen in cardiac diseases can you just try and see in which condition there is severe weight loss okay the answer is 
many conditions are there. One important condition is valvular heart diseases. When there are multiple valvular heart diseases, you find that the patient is extremely thin. Okay, so weight loss can be seen. And the other picture is weight gain. Weight gain is because of edema. Okay, maybe it is because of edema. The best example is congestive heart failure, especially a right-sided heart failure. Okay, there is weight gain. Next is syncope. Syncope is another feature which indicates that the blood supply is not adequate to reach to the brain. Okay, so syncope is, some, some people they say about syncope or even vertigo, dizziness, which can happen due to cardiac diseases. So the answer is very simple. You all know this. The usual complaints with patient comes to a cardiac uh, emergency unit is either because of a chest pain or because of a breathing difficulty, tiredness, vertigo, okay, excessive weight gain or weight loss. And next is cyanosis. We know like, especially when the respiratory thing is going to be severely compromised okay the blood circulation is severely compromised the patient can end up with cyanosis in um, again the example is congenital heart diseases if you're going to see when there are congenital heart diseases a child turns blue is it not like in the case of tetralogy of phallic when the child is going to cry the child turns blue that is cyanosis so cyanosis is bluish discoloration which is seen dyspnea is a very classic feature of say uh, a patient who is going to suffer from uh, heart failure failure, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Okay, so dyspnea, even in other cases like valvular heart diseases, patient may complain of breathing difficulty. Dependent edema. Dependent edema means do you know that with gravity, there is swelling. If a patient is going to sit, then the edema is seen in the gluteal region or even the patient is going to sit with the legs dangling on the, uh, you know, like how I am sitting. The leg is going to be dangling down. Then after some time, they will find that there is edema in the lower limb. So dependent edema is a classic feature of right-sided heart failure and also in other conditions. So edema is another one complaint, palpitations. Again, valvular heart diseases, we find palpitations is a usual complaint which is being told by a patient. Like for example, mitral regurgitation. There is the patient complains of palpitations. What is palpitations? The patient can hear his or her own heartbeat. That is the thing. So in uh, the second thing, what we have discussed so far is the chief complaints. Okay, so the chief complaints is what are the complaints with which the patient came to the cardiac unit? So you may have to describe about that. Did the patient have breathing difficulty? Did your patient have chest pain? Where exactly? Was it a retrosternal chest pain or a substernal? chest pain, dyspnea, whether it is a mild dyspnea, moderate dyspnea or severe dyspnea, whether there is dependent edema, is the patient complaining of any weight gain or weight loss. So these are the usual things you are going to write in chief complaints. Next is on the initial assessment, we are going to check the vital signs. Okay, vital signs is one important thing which gives you a lot of idea regarding the patient's condition. So, we know what comes under vital signs. We have to check the temperature. The most important thing is the pulse. Okay, so in pulse, we have to check for the rate, rhythm and quality. We all know what is rate. It should be between 60 to 100. If it is going to go below 60, it is bradycardia. And if it is going to be, be uh, above 100, it is going to be tachycardia. Next is rhythm and quality. Rhythm should be regular, is it not? It should come 1, 2, Three, the rhythm should be regular. But in some cases, what happens? The rhythm is irregular. And that is what you call it as arrhythmias. When the rhythm is not regular, you call it as arrhythmias. Quality of the pulse. Normally, a pulse should be strong. You should be able to feel it. But in a case of a patient with coming with a cardiogenic shock, you may find that the pulse is very thready. You're not able to feel it. Or in extreme cases where you have this collapsing pulse, you can feel a pulse and suddenly the pulse collapses. You know that these things things are not so uh, normal. Okay, so vital signs, you have to check the temperature, give more importance to the pulse. Next is respiration. Respiration, we have to see the rate and the rhythm. Why respiration we have to assess in a cardiovascular assessment? Because even in a cardiac problem, there can be changes in the respiratory rate and respiratory rhythm. Like for example, a patient with severe heart failure, 
can suffer from dyspnea where the respiratory rate is going to be very high and the respiration is not so normal the patient is going to have only a shallow respiration okay so in we have to give importance to respiration then the next one is blood pressure if you are doing a cardiovascular assessment okay proper cardiovascular assessment in your third year bsc level okay what you have to do is you have to check whether this patient is suffering from orthostatic hypotension i know that most of you know what is orthostatic hypotension what is orthostatic hypotension so the ortho here it refers to the position okay with each position change there is a change in the blood pressure so now the question is normally normally the person is not having any cardiac problem if you are going to check the blood pressure will there be any variations between lying sitting and standing the answer is yes even for a normal person the blood pressure checked in the lying position after few minutes you make the patient to sit after 2 minutes of sitting you check the blood pressure and then you make the patient to stand up wait for 2 to 3 minutes and then check the blood pressure you will find that there is a small variation between the lying bp the sitting bp and the standing bp why is it so because as we are getting up okay the uh, the blood vessels and the blood pressure are trying to normalize within themselves and so what happens is there is a slight drop in the blood pressure as we move from a lying position to a sitting to a standing position now but there is a limit okay when though i said that there is variation you should there should not be a greater variation there should there is a minimal variation so what is that minimal variation the minimal variation is this normally in a systolic blood pressure a drop of maximum is 10 to 15 10 to 15 mm of mercury there can be a drop okay and in diastolic bp it should be between 5 to 10 not more than that but if the systolic blood pressure is going to drop more than 20 and if the diastolic blood pressure is going to drop more than 10 you say that this patient is suffering from orthostatic hypotension i'll give you an example now for example patient's lying bp is say 140 okay and sitting and then standing if you are going to see from a lying bp to a standing bp you find that the patient's blood pressure is okay 110 okay lying bp was 140 okay the standing bp is 110 okay now how much variation is there in the systolic 30 30 millimeters of mercury there is drop which means the patient is suffering from orthostatic hypotension systolic bp should not drop more than 20 okay in fact the perfect definition is like this 10 to 15 is okay in systolic diastolic 5 to 10 is okay so which means 140 90 when a patient is standing up it should be if, if i'm going to tell you a value of 110 70 definitely this patient is suffering from orthostatic hypotension and this is something very important because a patient who is having orthostatic hypotension has more chance for falls when a patient is getting up from the bed because the blood pressure is falling it's dropping very badly so automatically when a patient gets up what happens he will have giddiness okay so that is why it is very important to check the blood pressure in the three positions what are the few important points as a nursing student you should remember is after the patient sits immediately don't take the blood pressure first take the lying bp next take the sitting bp wait for at least two minutes two minutes and then check the blood pressure for each position change minimum two minutes maximum three or four minutes you can wait and then check the blood pressure to get a correct estimate of this blood pressure okay and another one thing is when you are taking in the blood pressure always the apparatus should be at the level of the heart so if if someone wants to check my blood pressure there should be either it should be kept in a table which is at the level of the heart okay or you can get the help of somebody else who can hold the apparatus for you so that you can check the blood pressure at the level of the heart so this should be followed both for sitting as well as standing position so this is how we have to check and this is something very important it's not like ordinarily taking a vital signs please give importance to the pulse the respiration the blood pressure for orthostatic hypotension what else comes under initial assessment height and weight 
this is something important as i told you earlier the uh, we have to see what is the body mass index because we know that a person who is obese a person who is overweight has more chance for ending up with cardiovascular disease uh, because uh, there can be chances for high triglycerides and uh, even this uh, uh, triglycerides and the cholesterol and which can end up with you know the patient can end up with the higher risk for atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease so height and weight is something important so what did we study in the initial assessment initial assessment we have to check the chief complaints what are the complaints of your patient number 2 you are going to check the vital signs number 3 you are going to check the height and the weight with this we move on to the third roman letter 3 past health history what past health history should i ask to the patient ask him all these are the past health history which is related to cardiac diseases diabetes hypertension any high cholesterol or triglycerides whether this patient has suffered from any heart diseases in the when he was a child say congenital heart diseases any uh, history of uh, recurrent tonsillitis rheumatic fever rheumatic heart disease okay so whatever is concerned related to cardiac you will have to find out significantly is there anything positive in the past? past health history then not only collecting about the disease conditions the next thing what we can ask is when was the last time the ecg was taken the stress test okay there is a treadmill was taken what are the uh, what was the cholesterol level in the past any history of cardiac catheterization echocardiogram any diagnostic procedures how about any history of cardiac surgeries so i am collecting a complete history not only from the medical aspect but also from the surgical aspect and also from the diagnostic aspect what was the significant past health history of this patient related to cardiac medicine surgery and the investigations so past history of any heart disease or hospitalization so that finishes the third one so the third one is mainly related to the past history now coming on to roman letter 4 that is current lifestyle and psychosocial status lifestyle is very important yes if we, we we all agree that lifestyle is something very important in order to prevent cardiac diseases so what should i ask in the lifestyle number one is nutrition what type of diet is this patient taking up now what diet how should i write it ma'am you you can write whether the patient is following a normal diet if the patient is having hypertension or if the patient is suffering from diabetes or high cholesterol you can write whether the patient is taking a therapeutic diet is this patient following a hypertensive diet or a diabetic diet okay so what about the daily diet of the patient what is the usual weight of the patient and when did this patient have a sudden weight gain or a sudden weight loss or was it a gradual weight gain or was it a gradual weight loss these are the things i am interested to find out from this patient i want to know what is his dietary pattern what type of food he takes is he always taking up non vegetarian foods or is he taking only vegetarian foods what about about the diet is it a normal diet is he complying to this therapeutic diet or not now coming on to the next one is smoking history in smoking smoking is one factor highly uh, predisposing factor to cardiac diseases especially coronary artery disease now related to smoking what history i should ask all of us know i'll have to ask how many years he was smoking how many cigars he was smoking so in one word i can say that we have to collect the pack year history what do you mean by pack year history it is this number of packs per day into number of years for example if a patient used to smoke two packs of cigars per day and he has been smoking for the past 20 years then his pack year history is 20 into 2 which is equal to 40 years see when i listen that this is a uh, pack year history the number of the pack year history will tell us how significant he is having a high risk factor towards cardiac disease so smoking history diet history what else the next thing is we have to collect about alcoholism alcoholism smoking both are having alcoholism smoking diet and sedentary lifestyle all these things are highly predisposing to cardiac diseases so related to alcohol what should i ask just like smoking since how many years he is taking alcohol how much ml he is trying to take and when did he have his last drink now coming on to exercise exercise sedentary lifestyle i think uh, 
lot of people end up with cardiac disease, especially due to sedentary lifestyle. So sedentary lifestyle, we may have to ask, what is his activity level? Is he a sedentary or a moderate or a heavy worker? What about his amount of exercise? Is he following any exercise schedule? per day or per week. Some people, they do exercise, say, three days in a week or five days in a week. So, we'll have to ask that. And what type of exercise are these uh, people doing? Is it just isotonic exercise or is it isometric exercise or is it aerobic exercise? So, we have to find the details. That will give us an idea about the health status of the patient. So, this is what we have to collect related to alcohol, smoking, diet, exercise. Next is related to drugs. This also comes under current lifestyle and psychosocial status. Though this patient, I am going to do a cardiovascular assessment, there is a high chance that this patient, especially if he is a case of CAD, coronary artery disease, there is a high chance that this patient is going to have a list of drugs which he is taking every day, he or she is taking every day. So maybe the usual drugs what these people take up are antihypertensives, anticoagulants, okay, because uh, when there are cases of thrombosis, the patient is put on anticoagulants, people who have undergone some valvular heart surgery, they are on lifelong anticoagulants, aspirin or beta blockers, aspirin, we you know, antiplatelet, it, it, it prevents the aggregation of platelet. Beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, all those things comes under antihypertensives. Is the patient taking digoxin, diuretics, usually pulmonary edema patients who are prone, uh, heart failure, congestive heart failure, patients are put on Lasix, okay, or any other diuretics. So diuretics and whether they are following any over-the-counter drugs or any herbal supplements. So related to medicines, we need not ask each and everything, are you taking this, are you taking this? Just ask them what are the drugs you are taking every day uh, along with all the other drugs what you are taking now what are the usual drugs which you take up so this all if you collect that part is over that is current lifestyle and psychosocial status so what all did we collect in current lifestyle the smoking the diet alcohol exercise drugs now coming on to roman letter 5 we will have to collect a detailed history related to cardiovascular family history family history why is it so important because whatever i have put in the slide most of these cases comes through the genetics okay there is a family inheritance okay so usually we say hypertension runs in families diabetes runs in families obesity is there it is a genetic trend so i would like to know what is the health state status of other people in the family, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, CAD, anyone suffered from angina, MI, what about his parents, anyone uh, died because of any sudden cardiac death, all those things are an indication that there is a high risk factor for this patient to suffer from a cardiac disease. So, family history of cardiovascular disease, we have to collect and you will have to write it. Okay, so that finishes the most of the history part is over. Okay, the patient profile, the initial assessment where we collected the vitals, the height and weight, next chief complaints. Okay, then we collected about their, uh, the family history, sorry, the personal history, the past history, the present personal and psychosocial status, family history. Now coming on to the sixth Roman letter six, we are going to find out the review of cardiovascular signs and symptoms. Okay. Okay. Usual signs and symptoms be told in the first slide that is in the chest pain, fatigue. So, what else should I collect? So, this I know that most of you are thorough with this provocative PQRST. Okay, P stands for provocative or palliative, Q stands for quality, R stands for radiation, S stands for sight, and T stands for duration and the timing. So, let us see one by one. So, when I am going to review the cardiovascular signs and symptoms, number one is chest pain. First thing what I am going to ask is related to provocative or palliative factor. What do you mean by this? Provocative is what is making this chest pain worse? What is making it very bad? Maybe the patient will say that when I am trying to move, when I am trying to walk, when I am trying to climb the steps, the chest pain is very severe. But what is palliative? What helps to reduce the pain? When I took up a nitroglycerin sublingually, I found that my pain has reduced. When I took rest, my pain is reduced. When I when I was sitting in a foulest position, my pain reduced. So, what makes your pain better? 
what makes your pain worse that is you know uh, palliative or provocative factors so maybe resting sitting leaning forward sublingual nitroglycerin can reduce pain i don't know the patient has to tell what helped him then cold or emotional stress sexual intercourse smoking meals or swallowing may increase the pain so we'll have to exactly find out what happened maybe after taking a very heavy load or after having a very uh, a very sad incident in a family a patient suddenly gets into angina or myocardial infarction maybe it is an emotional stress so that has to be identified that is p now coming on to q q is quality we may have to ask what type of pain are you suffering is some people will say that it is like a, uh, what is a heavy weight which is kept over the chest okay it's like the chest is burdened by keeping a heavy weight that can be a strangling type of pain some will say that it's something like squeezing within my chest maybe it is a squeezing pain or a tightness or some pressure in the throat that can be the type of pain whatever the patient is telling in his own words you will have to write what is the quality maybe it is a piercing pain maybe it is a burning pain maybe it is a tightness or maybe it is a heavy weight kept whatever okay you will have to write that is the quality next is r r stands for the region and the radiation region means whether it is in the substernal or whether it is in the retrosternal and radiation is we know that like uh, chest pain associated with myocardial infarction usually it is a radiating type of pain so you will have to write where exactly it radiated maybe to the left limb or to the left shoulder that has to be written next is yes yes stands for severity and associated symptoms severity i'm sorry uh, earlier i told it as sight i'm correcting it, it is severity and associated symptoms what is severity we know on a scale of 0 to 10 what is your pain level that is severity associated symptoms usually patients with mi when they get admitted into a cardiac emergency unit you will find that patient says that they have profuse sweating uh, they may they would have had one episode of vomiting and some people they would have had you know breathlessness sometimes giddiness all those things are associated symptoms which means chest pain is the main thing along with that what other symptoms were there that you are going to ask and write under s yes. the last one is t which stands for timing and duration how long this pain last okay is it only during the morning hours or is it only during the evening or night hours or is it all through the day or just 20 minutes or one hour back did you have a chest pain what is the duration what is the timing timing is morning evening night duration is how how long that pain is lasting now for example patients with a stable angina they may have pain for few minutes and after that when they take rest that pain completely subsides okay so maybe they'll say that the pain lasted for say 1 minute or 2 minutes or 5 minutes that is the timing and the duration so that is what you will have to uh, write under the first symptom sign and symptom that is chest pain so what should i write p q r s t what are they provocative palliative quality radi uh, the region and the radiation severity and associated symptoms timing and the duration next is we are going to review the second symptom that is dyspnea what should i collect related to dyspnea please find out whether this dyspnea is present always or is it associated only with some activity which means in one word is it a continuous dyspnea or is it an intermittent dyspnea is it related to activity or is it related to rest now for example in stable angina if you are going to see the pain is associated with uh what to say the pain is associated with the activity maybe dyspnea comes with the activity but when taking rest it is perfectly okay but in some cases like prince metals or unstable angina if you are going to see sometimes the pain will be there the breathing difficulty will be there even without any activity heart failure patients even without any activity in the middle of the night they experience dyspnea so is it related to activity or rest did it occur suddenly or unexpectedly is it associated with a change in position that is pnd paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea patient when he is sitting up he is not having dyspnea but once he lies down in a supine position he will have dyspnea that is like orthopnea so we will have to find information related to that next is we have to ask about the symptom of cough cough is associated with cardiac diseases especially uh, if you are going to see 
due to heart failure a patient goes into pulmonary edema okay this patient will have severe cough okay there will be cough and breathing difficulty and the patient gets admitted the root causes cardiac problem ended up with a respiratory condition called as pulmonary edema so please ask whether the cough is consistent or intermittent what is the frequency of cough when does it come what is the severity is this, is it associated with sputum production maybe it is related to infection or is it related to a blood tinge sputum or how about whether it is a dry cough blood tinge sputum bouts of cough okay it can be a signal whether the patient is going into pulmonary edema next is fatigue tiredness as i told you in heart diseases in uh, valvular heart diseases in heart failure patient is highly tired please ask them whether it is a sudden onset of fatigue or whether it is a gradual onset of fatigue all through the day is it there or only during specific times okay the next one is edema edema means it is a swelling okay what type of edema are we interested we have to find out whether it is unilateral edema or bilateral edema usually in renal patients you will find periorbital edema but whereas in cardiac conditions you don't find periorbital edema but usually it is pedal edema okay it is usually pedal edema and sometimes in right sided heart failure there is generalized body edema that is called as anasarca generalized body edema the whole body is swollen because of fluid retention water retention okay so unilateral or is it bilateral and now unilateral edema means it is edema is there only in one limb okay unilateral edema uh, maybe it is not due to water retention maybe it can be some infection or cellulitis or lymphedema something like that bilateral means there is a chance Chance that it is a cardiac disease. Okay, whether it is in the feet and the leg, whether along with edema there is any associated symptom like dyspnea, is it getting relieved? Now, uh, usually it is like that. Okay, cardiac diseases. If you are going to see, when a person is sitting by gravity, the fluid will come into the leg and there is edema. But if a patient is going to lift the legs up and lie down, the edema will reduce. Okay, so we will have to find out whether the edema is getting relieved after sleep, whether it is pitting edema or non-pitting edema. What do you mean by pitting edema, non-pitting edema? The answer is there in the word itself. Pit, P-I-T. Pit. What do you mean by pit? Pit means it is a depression. No, it is a, a pit is a depression. That is called as a pit. Okay. Now, what is a pitting edema? So, I mean, for example, uh, this is uh, what I say. Uh, in the case of a legs. Okay. In case of legs, if you are going to see, especially in the lower limbs, if there is a pitting edema, when you are going to press it like this, okay, with two fingers, if you are going to press against a bone in the lower leg, what happens is. There will be a pit or an indentation which is seen. And once you find that there is that depression is there, you know that it is fluid which is causing the edema. And that is why you call that as a pitting edema. Okay. Suppose if I press it, say in a case of cellulitis, I hope all of you would have seen what is cellulitis. Since cellulitis, you know, there is complete inflammation of the subcutaneous tissue and uh, it is a very hard thing. Cellulitis, subcutaneous tissue is inflamed. And so when you're going to press, no pit will be there. Pitting edema, usually, you know why that pit occurs? The fluid is getting displaced. As I am pressing here, if there is a fluid accumulation, that fluid is moving away from that pressure. And that is why that pit is being formed. So it's very important to know whether a patient with cardiac disease is suffering from pitting edema or a non-pitting edema. Now, where exactly should I look for this? Okay, in the lower leg, we know where is the medial malleolus, the tibia, the fibula, the uh, the what to say, the metatarsal, that area, you know, that foot region, anywhere, you can just press with your two fingers against a bone. Press it against a bone. When you press it against a bone, you will find that, just press it for just two two seconds or three seconds, press it and then take your hand. If a pit is being formed, that is a case of pitting edema. So, uh, now we will have to grade it. Suppose if it is a pitting edema, you will have to grade it in a four-point scale. Okay, what is this four-point scale? It ranges from 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus and 4 plus. Okay, now what is 1 plus? It is a mild trace pitting edema. Okay, the that pit, no, that depression is less than 1 by 4 inch. 
okay 2 plus is mild which is 1 by 4 to half inch 3 plus is moderate half to 1 inch and 4 plus is severe greater than 1 inch now how to remember this we have to know what is inch and what is centimeters 1 inch is 2.5 centimeters so if you have a depression which is greater than 2.5 centimeters in a scale okay you know that oh my god the pitting edema is very severe because it is greater than 1 inch 2.5 centimeters okay but if it is going to be say 1 point something okay then you know that somewhere it is between mild to moderate pitting edema so you will have to study this because it's very important that when you write in your cardiovascular assessment you are going to write edema it is bilateral present on both the lower limbs it is found to be associated with dyspnea there is pitting edema grade is say 2 plus okay if you write like that the answer is complete when you write a cardiovascular assessment for your exam especially practical exam it is very important that you know certain important important points which can get help to gain a lot of marks okay so edema on a four point scale the last symptom is nocturia nocturia is another one problem with patients with uh, cardiac problem okay like especially uh, how long they are having this nocturia what is a change in pattern maybe it is when they are lying down uh, they have so much of fluids okay so what happens is maybe due to medicines or maybe due to their disease condition they will have intermittent they will have to empty their bladder okay so we will have to find whether the patient is suffering from nocturia so this is what we have to write about signs and symptoms chest pain the cuff the tiredness okay then the edema the fatigue dyspnea okay and the nocturia these are the most important points which we should cover in the signs and symptoms so far what we have done we have not yet started the real cardiovascular assessment that is our physical examination okay so what we have done is we we wrote the patient profile you wrote all the history of the patient the past the present, the family history, the psychosocial status, you reviewed all the signs and symptoms, the most important signs and symptoms, chest pain, cuff, dyspnea, nocturia, edema, okay, and tiredness. All these things have to be reviewed. Now we are going to enter into the physical examination. Now physical examination, the main physical examination, what we have to, we can divide it into three. That is a neck examination, the precordium examination and the peripheral vascular examination. Now, when I say that it is a neck examination, precordium and peripheral vascular, I will be completing only the neck examination in this video. Now, even before the neck examination, this is one thing which we usually see in patients with high cholesterol, santhalasma. Okay, so you see, uh, due to various copyright issues, I have not uh, downloaded pictures which is available in the Google. Okay, so please uh, you can just type xanthalesma in your Google uh, thing and then you can just check it. You get a real picture of xanthalesma. Okay, just for a clarity and put here the yellow color. It's not yellow actually. It can be, you know, a little bit hard and uh, skin uh, light. Slight yellow will be there and uh, here you can find, okay, around, especially in the upper and the lower eyelid here, not exactly on the eyelid here, the up, okay, here in this upper portion you will find here in the eyelid as well as here, most prominently in the upper eyelid. If you can find, okay, next time when you see a person, if you find a person having this particular, a little bit thickened skin, okay, over here and it is light yellow in color, ask them whether they are suffering from high cholesterol or uh, if, he, if he or she is a patient check his cholesterol level check the triglycerides level it will be increased and that is called as santhalasma so you can just have a note on your physical examination whether your patient is having santhalasma what does it indicate high cholesterol high triglycerides now we go on to the real examination that is a neck vessel in neck vessel i will have to do inspection palpation auscultation what is the first one inspection what should i examine in the neck of a person we'll have to examine the skin color whether there are any lesions over the uh, uh, neck region okay why color of the skin i will tell you the neck color okay it should if it is going to be very dark you know if it is going to be very dark for some people it's very dark and uh, they'll be having abdominal obesity you will find that that this has a relation with metabolic syndrome metabolic syndrome is 
going to predispose this patient to cardiac disease because high cholesterol will be there okay the triglycerides will be elevated patient may be diabetes patient may be hypertension all these things trunkal obesity will be there this all is called as metabolic syndrome so it's very important to see the color of the neck okay then any lesions are there any rashes are there whether the neck is looking symmetrical what do you mean by symmetrical if there is any thyroid gland overgrowth on one side you know when a goiter is there it is not symmetrical. So, any abnormal findings. Now, we come on to the thing that is jugular venous pulsation. So jugular venous pulsation is one examination which you are going to do on a patient, especially during your practical exam. Some examiners may ask you to do a JVP assessment. So, one thing what you should remember is if you are going to assess jugular venous pressure, what you should do? Make the patient to lie down in a 45 degree angle mid Fowler's position or sometimes even a little bit higher. So at least a Fowler's position can be given. Sometimes it is being done even in a supine position. For very prominent jugular vein in right-sided heart failure, even supine position you will get it. But best examination is in a Fowler's position. How much degree? 45 degree, 30 to 45 degree. Okay, you can make the patient to lie. So, what you should do first, either prop up the patient with a pillow or use a backrest and or you can even, you know, elevate the head end of the bed, okay, to around 30 to 45 degree angle. At least please be sure that you make the patient to lie down in a 45 degree angle. Now, what you should do is jugular venous pressure is actually the pressure in the right atrium. So, right atrial pressure is what I am measuring by jugular venous pressure okay so it is indirectly i am measuring what is the pressure in the right atrium okay now what i should do the patient is made to lie in a fowler's position begin with the patient relaxing in the bed head of the bed elevated yes 30 to 45 degree now it is always best to assess jugular vein on the right side okay if i am a patient okay the examination should be done on my right side because the right sided thing is found to be uh, more hemodynamically a stable value than what you take on the left side okay so that is why you have to position yourself where on the right side of the patient okay now my patient is lying in a 45 degree angle and where am i standing i am standing on the right side of the patient now what am i going to see the right side of the neck now what is the next step turn the patient's head slightly away from you so if i am a patient okay so the examiner is standing on my right side the neck will be okay the head is turned slightly towards the left why am i turning like this when i turn like this this neck you know this portion becomes extended when the neck is the neck muscles are extended beautifully you can visualize the vein especially if they are dilated especially if they are pulsating. Okay, so that is why turn the patient's head slightly from the side so that that extension is there and you can see the uh, veins. Now, use a light to identify the external and the internal jugular vein. We all know that anatomically we have internal as well as external jugular vein. So, we are going to focus on the right internal jugular vein. Look for pulsation in the suprasternal notch. Okay, so somewhere here is the suprasternal notch. You are going to see that and identify the highest point of pulsation. See, when we study JVP, you know, literally if you are going to measure Two things are very important, okay. One thing is I will have to find out where is the pulsation of the jugular vein. Number two, what I am going to see is I should find out where is the sternal notch, okay. I hope all of you know where is the sternal notch, okay. It is corresponding that raised area, okay. The raised area, what we have here is called as a sternal notch. Approximately it is equal to the second rib. Okay, the second drum. Okay, so there you are going to place, that is a sternal angle and there you are, you are going to place one scale. Okay, so suppose here, if you are going to see, two points are important. Now, in this picture, again, due to copyright issues, I am so sorry that I am not able to download and put the pictures in my PowerPoint. But let me tell you, if this is going to be the patient, okay, here, somewhere here will be the suprasternal notch, okay, the raised area, okay, that is the suprasternal notch, approximately equal to the second rib okay now here somewhere is a suprasternal notch this point you should be clear with the patient there you are going to keep one scale okay let us wait 
the scale can be kept later. That is one point of reference. The second thing is what my patient has turned his head to the uh, left side and you're going to examine the neck, neck veins. Okay. So what you should see is you should look whether any veins are dilated and whether there is any pulsative movements. Okay. Now, when I say this pulsative movements, okay, when you're going to examine this on the patient, you may find a carotid pulse. You know, carotid pulse will have that pulsation. Please don't take carotid pulse. Carotid pulse is not jugular vein. It is carotid artery. So, where is the jugular vein? Somewhere lateral to the carotid artery, you will find, if it is distended, you can easily find out the jugular vein. And the distension is more prominent in the base of the neck rather than the top of the neck. Here in the base of the neck, you will find the distended vein. Just go to Google. Type distended jugular vein. You will find a beautiful picture where the vein is distended as the patient has turned his head to one side. So this is usually a classical feature of a right-sided heart failure. Coming back to the point, two reference points. So one is I have identified where is the sternal notch. Okay, the sternal angle. I have found out the angle of Lewis. I have identified that. The second is I identified where is the pulsation. Now, when you see the dilated vein, you will have to look for the highest point of pulsation. Suppose, for example, if a vein is distended over here, where is the highest point of pulsation that you have to identify? So, again, two reference points. One is the sternal angle. Another one is the highest point of pulsation. Now, what I am going to do is, I will keep a long size, uh, what to say, a small scale. I need two scales to measure JDP. One small scale, one long scale. What do you mean by small and long? Small scale is usually, you know, 15 centimeter scale. Okay. Long scale is 30 centimeter scale. Okay. So this short scale, where am I going to keep? I'm going to keep in the sternal angle here. Okay. The short scale I've kept in the sternal angle. Now I have looked for the pulsation here. From there, okay, the sternal angle, I have kept the scale like this. Okay, it is kept like this. If this is going to be the sternal angle, I have kept the scale like this. Okay, now another one scale, I am going to see where is the highest point of pulsation. That long size scale, I am going to keep straight from the highest point of pulsation to the scale which I have kept in the sternal angle. So something like this, okay, something like this where if you are going to see, this is going to be, okay, actually this should be the, uh, the scale, if you're going to see this is a long size scale and if this is going to be a short scale, okay, this is kept over the sternal angle and this is going to be the thing from the highest point of pulsation. Now, this both will intersect. Now, you will have to measure the vertical distance. Please don't take that horizontal distance from here to here, don't measure. Where it is intersecting, take the vertical distance. It should be less than 3 centimeters. If it is less than 3 centimeters, the patient's jugular venous pressure is normal. Okay. But if it is more than 3 centimeters, you will say that it is an elevated JVP. Elevated JVP. Now, there is another way of telling this. Okay. So, we will have to measure the vertical distance and some people, they say that you add 4 centimeters to this whatever centimeter. This vertical distance, say for example, I got I got it as 2. Okay, now you will have to add 4 centimeters along with 2 centimeters. So, the normal JVP is 6 to 8 centimeters. Why am I adding that 4 centimeter? That is the distance between the sternal angle to the right atrium. See, I am keeping a scale in the sternal angle. But from there to the right atrium inside, so approximately 4 centimeters is there. So, only when I add that, you say that it is 6 to 8 centimeter, whichever is easy you study, okay. If the, the vertical distance, if it is less than 3 centimeter, normally JVP is normal, okay. But the normal value when you say, you say it is 6 to 8 centimeters of water, okay. So, this is how you will have to uh, check the JVP. Now, coming on to the practical concerns, usually when students, they try, try, try for measuring JVP in a very normal person, you may find it very difficult to find out the exact 
JVP value. Okay, because the veins are not distended and it may take a lot of time in order to find exactly where is the pulsation. But in a patient with a distended jugular vein, it's such a wonderful thing to do this JVP on that particular patient because the patient turns his head, the vein becomes distended. I keep one small size scale on the sternal angle. I keep a long size scale from the highest point of pulsation, keep it straight and intersect it with the small scale, measure the vertical distance that gives you the JVP value. So uh, please don't be upset if you're not able to get the exact JVP value in a very normal person. But the most important is you should learn how to check a jugular venous uh, pulsation. You will have to learn that. Don't check the carotid artery, come to the lateral aspect of the carotid artery. Next is, so that completes the inspection. Now coming on to palpation. Palpation, what should I palpate? Palpate for carotid artery. The main artery which is there in the neck is carotid artery. I am sure that all of you know how to palpate for a carotid artery. With your just two fingers, okay, you can just come down below the angle of the jaw. Just laterally here, you will find that you are getting very nicely the carotid artery pulsation. Now, what are the main things you will have to uh, uh, look for? Please make sure that you are not pressing both the carotid arteries together because the blood circulation to the brain will be completely cut off and that can end up with a lot of problem. So just use two fingers, one carotid artery at a time, okay, and then you are going to uh, look for the quality of the pulsation. You can count the number of pulses, etc. Then in the neck vessels, you are going to see what is the texture, tenderness, temperature, any mass is there in the neck, any growth or any mass or any lymph node is enlarged in the neck. All those things can be done in palpation. So inspection, please remember, Lot of things are there. Important one is JVP. Palpation, lot is there. Check for the temperature, moisture, mass, etc. Most important is carotid artery palpation. Auscultation. Auscultation, we will have to check for the carotid artery. Brew it. What do you mean by brew it? Brew it is a sound, an abnormal sound which is heard. Uh, whenever a blood vessel is having an atherosclerosis. Whenever a patient is having atherosclerosis, there is more chance that a patient can, uh, we can listen a brew it when you are going to auscultate in the neck. Now, auscultation for auscultating the carotid artery for any brew it. So, what should be done? Where should I keep the, the stethoscope? People say that uh, we can use well of the stethoscope to listen clearly to a carotid artery brew it. But some textbooks also say that we can use either the bell or the diaphragm. So, whichever is comfortable, you can do either a bell or a diaphragm, but more specifically will be the this part, okay, the bell of the stethoscope. Now, where should I uh, check for it? There are three areas where you can listen to it. One is just at the angle of jaw. Second is in the mid-cervical area. And third is in the base of the neck. These are the three areas where you can keep your carotid, uh, where you can keep your stethoscope. Now, how to check for it? Even before I go on to that, I'll tell you what is, why that brewage sound is coming. See, when you are going to have a blood vessel, okay, which is very patent, the blood is flowing. Okay, the blood is flowing very smoothly. Okay, but suppose if there is an obstruction within this blood vessel. Okay, there is an obstruction. When there is an obstruction, the blood has to exert more pressure in order to push the blood into the other side. Agree? Now, that time, what happens is, the, uh, the blood is trying to push with the pressure, which can create a sound, a swishing sound, okay? A swishing sound can be heard and that is called as bruit. Normally, there is no bruit. Why there is no bruit? Because blood is flowing very smoothly. But in case, wherever there is atherosclerosis, shall I tell you a very similar one, wheezing. Okay, what happens in wheezing? Bronchial secretions are there. When the bronchi is filled with secretion, the air is moving with pressure and that creates a musical sound. Same thing in a blood vessel. That is in bronchiole. This is in a blood vessel. In a blood vessel, when plagues are there, when atherosclerosis is there, the blood is trying to push with pressure, creating a swish, swishing sound. Okay, so that swishing sound can end up with, you can listen to that with the help of a stethoscope. Okay, so that is carotid artery brewing. Next is how to listen to it. What are the steps of the procedure? Okay, usually in the textbooks, they say hold the breath. Okay, but how I would like to uh, teach you is we have to hold the breath. What you do is you can uh, just first test it for yourself. 
okay take the uh, bell of the stethoscope keep it in the angle of the jaw or say the mid cervical area okay keep it on one side and then what you're going to do i am not not fingers okay you have to keep the bell of the stethoscope keep it over there tell the patient to inhale and exhale okay so when the patient is inhaling you will be able to listen to the movement of the air air is the patient is taking a breath so i am keeping it over the neck region but i can listen to the movement of the air on exhaling also i can listen to the movement of the air then what i am going to tell tell the patient to exhale and hold the breath hold the breath when a patient is holding the breath he should not hear any sound because air is not entering air is not leaving if you are able to hear any other sound okay that may indicate it is a carotid artery atherosclerosis that is called as a carotid artery bruvit that is how you do it it's a wonderful thing if you can cardiac assessment if uh, your examiner is going to tell during the practicals to do the neck examination confidently do the jvp feel for the carotid artery in the patient okay on one side first and then the other side third is beautiful okay you take the stethoscope put the bell of the stethoscope angle of the jaw check on the other side the mid cervical area on one side and then on the other side inhale i can listen exhale i can listen hold the breath i should not listen anything if i listen anything that may indicate it's a carotid artery atherosclerosis and that is called as bruvit okay so it is not a very nice condition because carotid artery if there is atherosclerosis we know you know later on what can happen there can be decreased blood flow to the brain there can be thrombosis there can be embolism so that is what we are measuring by a simple test of auscultation so this is the part 1 video where i have covered cardiac assessment history the examination and the even before the examination the review of signs and symptoms and the examination only the neck the neck examination what did we study inspection okay you are going to inspect mainly for many things along with that jugular venous pulsation number 2 auscultation what did i uh, even before auscultation palpation carotid artery number 3 is auscultation on auscultation the main thing what we should auscultate is carotid artery bruvit okay that is usually seen in atherosclerosis when the arteries are narrow when the arteries are hardened due to that atherosclerosis or atheroma a patient will end up with a bruvit i sincerely uh, wish and pray that this video is going to be useful for those students who wants to learn the basics of cardiac assessment again i am telling you i am not teaching a highly advanced uh, cardiac assessment there are much more to each part of it there are much more to each and every part of the physical examination but sincerely i pray that for those students who struggle okay at least to learn what is the what how to do an examination okay i hope and i sincerely pray that this video is going to be useful so thanks a lot for watching my video thank you for your great support love and encouragement and i will be uploading part 2 video where i will be discussing regarding the precordium assessment and the peripheral vascular assessment so thank you very much